Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird Movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 118 of Warbird Tube. Tonight, we're going to take a look back at very early aviation history centered around the Houston area. But before we get started with our topic tonight, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe and follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, also click on that bell icon and you will get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube as they become available. Now, as you're watching tonight, if you have some questions, just type them in the, uh, the chat section and we'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off. And joining me now uh, from the Houston area, Michael Bloodworth. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the uh, first Aero Squadron. Michael, welcome back. Hi there. Glad to be here. We yeah. have a, an interesting story. And, you know, as things are going on in the aviation world, uh, we're at the point where you can say that over 100 years ago, right? Uh, yeah. we've crossed an important milestone. And, and as you know, we're in the 20s. And we're going to go back beyond that in this quick look. The, uh, the first Aero Squadron, when the United States government took a lot of convincing to get involved in aviation, uh, the rights were on their case and, they, and really nothing happened. And they finally uh, uh, were able to demonstrate uh, the airplane, the government bought one, and the government said, well, we need to set up a, a, a aviation squadron, and they put it under the Signal Corps, and they called it the first, uh, the, uh, first uh, aerospace, or not aerospace, what am I saying? First aero squadron, yeah. and this is the, uh, this is the outfit uh, in College Park, Maryland, that got the right flyer, the military flyer, and they conducted tests with it about uh, what possible things you could do with an airplane. Uh, once again, uh, since it's a new thing and the military is always rather stuck in the mud, uh, they didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so they shot guns from it, they dropped bombs from it, they, they did all sorts of things. Uh, unfortunately, they also suffered the first fatality in an airplane in the United States when uh, Lieutenant Selfridge mm -hmm. died in a crash and Wilbur Wright got, uh, w was injured. Uh, but all this happened in College Park, uh, Maryland. And, and again, you know, I have, this is what I really want to look at is the deployment of the first Aero Squadron to Texas City. So very quickly after commencement in, uh, in uh, uh, College Park, Maryland. They uh, went to California. They went to San Antonio, and then San Antonio kicked them to the Galveston office of the mm -hmm. Signal Corps. Uh, I mean, no one knew what to do with them. Uh, they, uh, the contract with the Wright brothers had, had ended, and they couldn't, they didn't have any, they had one pilot. Uh, Fulu, and uh, he had to teach everyone. But uh, Galveston sent them to Texas City, and uh, they set up a camp there. And what you're seeing here is a, a vintage postcard uh, from that time. And what a this is one of the very few images we have, uh, and it shows what you might expect: a bivouac of tents in Texas City, uh, right next to the water. Uh, now, if you look closely, uh, you'll notice there's a right flyer just to the side of the American flag. Uh, but I can assure you that that airplane has been drawn in, uh, just like the Longhorn, uh, and probably the boats as well. Anything to make it uh, look friendly and welcoming, I suppose. But that's our best image of the overall camp at uh, Texas City. Let's look at a map. That's your cue. 
There we go. Now this is an authentic 1913 map, and I'm gonna use it here for a number of different reasons. Uh, first off, you can see I've circled Texas City down there. And if you notice, it's on the mainland, while Galveston, which is their headquarters, is on the island. And that's what I mean, you take a boat or a train, you just don't uh, drive over there uh, to it. But even more importantly, if you notice, I've circled uh, Texas City and I've put an arrow to Moses Lake. And it's on the southern shore of Moses Lake, which is not a lake. <laughs> uh, uh, and that's where the camp was. And uh, this meant that it would be in a, in a marshy area. What a, a terrible, terrible yeah. place for it. <laughs> but this is, this is 1913. And this is also an occasion to, to point out why this area has attracted aviation. And if you look up, I have also put a note there that uh, for uh, South Houston, and or I'm trying to point at it, but I know you can't see that, but South Houston is where the first airplane flight in Texas occurred in 1910. So we're in the same general area, and the area is called the Coastal Plains. The Coastal Plains are grass, they're flat, and they're wide open. And at first blush, it looks like an ideal location for some type of air base because you don't have trees, mountains, uh, hills, uh, anything to get in the way. And sure enough, uh, here we are in uh, Texas City trying to set up an encampment. I also noted where Ellington will end up, if you look on there, the location, the future for future of Ellington Field is also up there much farther inland, but still very much in the coastal plains. Uh, Houston was very advanced in terms of aviation. Not only was the first flight made in Houston, in South Houston in 1910, but we had a major air show in 1911 in which a number of aircraft uh, were involved, uh, both in a touring group, the Muslim International Aviators, and a bunch of locally uh, owned airplanes. So to have more airplanes come in was uh, pretty much uh, par for the course. All right, let's see what the next map is. There you go. This is a, a more modern, this is a 1947 sectional showing Texas City. Uh, and it's better. It's a better map than the other one. And it shows Moses Lake uh, right there above. Those are two later airports, the Gulf Coast and the Texas City Airport. Uh, they did not last long. Uh, and they're not related to uh, the, the encampment. But that gives you a good indication of where we are. And again, I'll point out, you're on the mainland, you're not with Galveston, which is one of Texas's largest cities at the time. Uh, you're really out in a field somewhere and it is a damp, uh, muddy uh, field. <laughs> not a mosquitoes. great place. <laughs> with mosquitoes and mosquitoes and mud were yeah. mentioned yeah. in the reports. All right, let's go. Uh, well, this is uh, perhaps the, the best photograph I found that really shows as much as the encampment uh, as we can. Once again, those are canvas hangers uh, for the airplanes. You have bivouac canvas tents for the crews, and you have canvas uh, hangers uh, for the airplanes. And, and what you're looking at there is both a good picture and not a very good picture. Uh, that is a, a Wright Model C, uh, okay. which was a standard issue from the aircraft. But what you can't see on this is the, the empennage, the empennage, or the tail feathers mm -hmm. of this airplane, because it's not a Wright Model C. It is a Burgess Wright Model I, uh, and uh, they, uh, Burgess, Mr. Burgess was a very interesting character. Uh, as you know, uh, the Wright brothers uh, developed a means of lateral control for, a, for their airplanes. Uh, you could bank it left and right, mm -hmm. and they filed a patent on that, and they uh, were assuaged of that patent by a number of sources, including Mr. Curtis, Glenn Curtis, and uh, and consequently, uh, the the Curtis planes were not 
uh, allowed to be purchased by the army and they weren't. Uh, but Mr. Burgess was very smart and he signed a license with the Wright brothers to produce their aircraft under license. So what you actually have here is a Burgess Wright hmm. uh, airplane. And it's the same thing. If you, the more you look at it, the more you notice that it is not a Wright flyer. It has most of the parts, but the most important part that you cannot see is or are the tail feathers on it. And this is an important step forward. Uh, in, by 1913, and this is 10 years after the Wright brothers flew, the Wright aircraft were almost dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, had been outclassed by European aircraft uh, very quickly. Uh, they were not being used by anyone because they're delicate and dangerous. And here we are with the military with these very fragile aircraft in a very uh, hostile environment. And uh, Burgess uh, did everything he could to improve their flight characteristics. And so Texas City becomes really an experimental airfield on how to improve uh, the right flyer. And as a matter of fact, uh, indeed, he did. Let's go to the next one. And here is his biggest improvement. Uh, as you know, a Wright Flyer is a pusher aircraft mm -hmm. with twin propellers on it. Uh, it also has, if you remember, the rudders in front and the, uh, no, the elevators in front and the rudders in the rear, uh, you know, a, a backwards looking aircraft. And one of the things that Mr. Burgess did is he reversed a lot of this and you're seeing it. it, it this is called a tractor. Uh, airplane, and that's because the propeller is in front, and it is now a tractor. And if you can look at the left side of it, you can barely see it. It has what we would consider to be a conventional tail. So, just like that, on the uh, mud fields of Texas with Mr. Burgess, uh, they've developed an airplane that we would recognize today as an airplane. Mm -hmm. If you think about it. The Wright Flyer, while certainly a phenomenal aircraft, was a design that was not repeated. I mentioned the air show in Houston in 19, uh, 1911. There were no Wright Flyers in it. There were no airplanes built as Wright Flyers. There were no airplanes that were takeoffs from Wright Flyers. There were Blerios, Demoiselles, and even a Curtis, but no Wright Flyers. And uh, that's because it's a dead end design. And uh, we have to credit Mr. Burgess here with his license uh, that he took, as it would say, with some license <laughs> to improve the aircraft. And sure enough, he did. And you can't read the text at the bottom very well. But this aircraft set a speed and distance record going between San Antonio and Texas City something that you would never want to do in a right flyer. So it was immediately more successful. I mean, today we look at this and as a child we go, oh yeah, that's what you do. You put the propeller in front and mm -hmm. have it drag you around. But in 1913, this is a, a great leap forward. Let's see what the next image is. Okay, this is a, a better image. Uh, of the, uh, you can barely see the, the rudder and the fin in the back, <laughs> just like a, an arrow, the, the tail fins go in the back. And uh, we see more of the, the encampment behind it. And uh, once again, the plane which broke all previous records duration and not, they flew from San Antonio to Texas City. I mean, that's really something. In, in 1913 to be able to do that and set a record. The other thing I like about this, and, and my job, I'm retired, but what I like to do uh, is, is to interpret old photographs and try and figure out what's going on. And uh, of course, I'm pointing at my screen. But if you look at the very bottom there, you can see the shadows of the photographers who are taking this picture. It adds a little bit of personality to it. And I suppose one of those shadows belongs to Mr. Higby, 
who was our intrepid photographer traveling far afield to take these pictures. Amazing. Let's see what comes up next. Yep. Oh, you're welcome to pipe up and say anything yep. you want. Uh, how did how did Burgess get away with modifying the aircraft when he was under license to the Wright brothers? I mean, I, I'm sure the Wrights didn't didn't come and inspect, but um, no, yeah, they, they didn't like it. Oh, they okay. didn't like it, and they would suspend his license uh, for it. Okay. That's all there was to that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind the, the, a few modifications, but uh, that a tremendous alteration. Oh, yeah. I mean, all he did was left the Wright brothers' wings, yeah. put a tractor engine on it and a different tail group, and you had a brand new airplane. They didn't like that at all. No. The United States was at a severe disadvantage. And even, even in the, the Houston Air Show in 1911, 1911, with uh, these French airplanes, the Blériots, the Demenzels, they all outperformed anything that the uh, Wright brothers were doing. In 1910, when uh, Paul Hahn did the first flight in Houston, he used a Farman biplane, which only the fact that it's a biplane does it resemble the Wright flyer, but it was a much better performer than the Wright flyer. And uh, the United States very quickly fell behind in the technologies needed. So here, Burgess is making a, a, a great leap forward. I love these old photographs. I've been colorizing some of them, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. But here's the original, and we see we see the the crew uh, and the uh, the. Uh, of course, the, the pilots uh, or pilot, I'm sure it's a pilot and passenger. And uh, notice it is a right uh, flyer with the twin pushers, but with the different tail group on it, making mm -hmm. it a Burgess right. And uh, and they're very proud of their airplanes. Remember, this is like moonshot technology. This is what's happening is to be working with the government of these airplanes. However, I do like the guy on the right side that's kind of slouching on the wires. <laughs> Everyone else looks very, very professional, and he's just sort of ha literally hanging onto the airplane. Yeah, you know, they, it, it takes a while to make a photograph like this, and I'm yeah. sure he said, okay, you guys, stand at attention, or their sergeant said, stand at attention. Yeah. Oh, he got tired of standing. So it, it, <laughs> it lends some personality to it. It certainly does. Well, uh, this is Captain DeWitt Milling, and can you go back to that prior photo, yep. please? Yep. There Notice you go. the writing in the middle. See, it says Milling up there, and it points to the guy on our right. There he is. That is Captain Milling. Um, <laughs> all I can say is, uh, you know, he was a captain down there among all these lieutenants, and uh he was uh, one of the ones that made that uh, that flight. So I'd say he's one of the leaders in technology at the time. There he is, Captain DeWitt Milling. Hmm. I love finding old photos and being able to put them together with different, uh, with, uh, to, to flesh it out. You know, right. we concentrate on the technology and the machines that, you know, this is a bunch of guys and they're out in, the, in a muddy field. And, you know, we say, oh, this, that, but, you know, there's every time you flew, there's going to be a long session of wire twisting, fabric yeah. covering, uh, and mosquito biting uh, <laughs> that you just had to put up with. Remember, this, uh, this deployment started in March of 1913. Okay. Let's see who else turns up. Another yeah. good shot uh, that shows the uh, encampment. The, the canvas hangers behind uh, the right Model C, which we now know is a Burgess right because the uh, tail planes are different. You can barely see the difference in there. And uh, it's just uh, what a great idea that uh, they decided to go ahead and uh, hold on a second. There we go. You couldn't see that, but I could. I was getting rid of my notes. <laughs> Don't, I don't, I need three eyes, you know, I need this one <laughs> and this one and then this one over here to look down in the corner. Uh, once again, it's uh, so wonderful to find uh, photographs like this. 
uh, remember photography was new as well, mm -hmm. particularly being able to take photographs like this uh, was extraordinary. But I guess they were doing it under a government contract and money wasn't a problem. Yeah. What a story Mr. Higby could have told on this. Let's see oh, what's sure. here. Yeah. 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 Now, this is North Island, Carolina. Uh, the uh, the first Aero Squadron after its deployment uh, to uh, uh, Texas City uh, would depart and they would go to North Island, uh, California. But uh, I wanted this one because there are several things that are worth looking at. This is probably the best look at the Burgess Wright uh, uh, airplane mm -hmm. that we've seen so far. The, the rear end, the empennage, is perhaps the, the clearest and more detailed than it ever has been. And, uh, you know, the thing to say about an airplane like that is, is that looks just like an airplane. Uh, this is what <laughs> we would expect an airplane to look like yeah. today. Uh, it has all the features uh, about it, and uh, consequently, it it, uh, it became the uh, the standard feature to use these. Yeah, I'm going to jump a I'm going to jump ahead of myself here because uh, the Air Service did recognize that, and after killing a bunch of cadets, uh, they decided in 1914, which is only the next year, that mm -hmm. that. Uh, they would uh, no longer fly Wright flyers and uh, destroy the entire fleet of uh, Wright pushers. Uh, they decided they were too dangerous. And you know what? That was a right decision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, it, as, we're, as we're looking at this this airplane, and you're right, it, it does have all the elements of, of what we would consider to be a, a normal aircraft, but uh, the uh, tail feathers are awfully small <laughs> compared to what we see on on uh, other aircraft uh, in more contemporary uh, nature. But uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot back there. No, but of course, you're looking at an airplane that was maybe going 45 or 50 right. miles an hour. You, you don't need uh, a lot of control surface area. And two, they didn't know. Right. And uh, it's the experiments like these that uh, taught them and taught us and taught the technology uh, that uh, on how to do it. You know, we, we give a lot of, um, we complain about government funding, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the government funding R&D projects <laughs> like this is where they make those uh, steps forward. Sometimes it takes us to the moon and other times it that turns into the uh, bright flyer around the other way yeah. and makes it work better. There you go. These are always fascinating pictures for, and from usually the World War One era where they're panoramic stitched together. But it, these are always fun. Indeed they are. And, and here we see the entire fleet of aircraft uh, at the Texas City deployment. And um, I think I've counted five of them here. Uh, so that's impressive that they have five that are working. Mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to see in this photograph, but on the very right, well, how about that? On the very right <laughs> is the Burgess right. Yep. Uh, the, only one, the only one they had in here. But once again, we can't see the tail feathers on these aircraft, but I'm confident that they are Burgess Wright model eyes, which is looks like a Wright flyer, but has a different uh empennage on it mm -hmm. here's a next photo is a detail to the very right and you can see the uh the burgess h on the end there uh once again looking like what we uh, what we recognize as an airplane today and it really stands in stark contrast to its companion next door yeah what was the the reason that they moved from texas city to california well, ultimately, uh, it, it was mosquitoes, hmm. mud, wind, <laughs> rain. Uh, in consequence, uh, in looking back uh, at the weather patterns, I did discover that in June of 1913, remember they deployed in March of 1913, in June, and June is the beginning of hurricane season, which we're in again right now this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, a storm did come through 
uh, to the south of them, uh, but it was close enough to where they had to have felt, uh, felt the effects of it. Uh, remember Galveston had been wrecked in the 1900 mm -hmm. uh, storm. Uh, their, uh, the history of storms on the Gulf Coast is prodigious. And I'm sure this tent city that they'd concocted on some marshland uh, suffered from the wind and rain of that 1913 uh, uh, hurricane. It does call it a hurricane, but it's a minor hurricane. And you know, it's a minor hurricane unless it does major damage to you, and then it's a major exactly. hurricane. But yeah. yeah, just looking at these these canvas hangers, yeah. I mean, how in the world uh, could something like that uh, withstand even a modest storm? Right. Yeah. <laughs> This is one of the more exciting adventures. This is, and once again, here we uh, see a Burgess uh, H on floats. And then notice it's the War Hydro Aeroplane mm -hmm. at Texas City. And it's dated, and I thank Mr. Higby again, wherever you are in heaven, thank you mm -hmm. uh, for signing it and dating it, leaving no question about uh, what we're doing. But uh, it gives a, since this is a rear view, it gives us a, excellent shot of how he has developed uh, the empennage of the right flyer uh, to improve it. We still see the twin pusher uh, props. It's not twin engines. Twin, It's one engine, two props. Yeah. But uh, And now it's on floats. I have no idea how well this went. I bet <laughs> it was disastrous. I was, uh, I was just going to ask if you knew how it flew because um, yeah, I wonder how they had enough horsepower to just even get it off the water. Well, I, they they should have uh, they should have done that, and yeah. of course, uh, uh, Glenn Curtis mm -hmm. and others, uh, quite a number of others, were doing uh, 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 seaplane mm -hmm. adventures. And my mentor is is sending me evil signals from from heaven. Uh, because I believe it's going to be 1912 that the first commercial airline flight in the United States occurred, okay. which was from Tampa to St. Petersburg in a, in a seaplane, yeah. a float plane. So seeing this here is pretty much uh, everyone was experimenting. Uh, Curtis also had a seaplane. And, well, here Burgess Wright has produced a, uh, a seaplane for the Army. What a great picture. I'm just yeah. thrilling to see that. This picture requires a lot of uh, explanation. Uh, I've really included it because, once again, you can see that tail group there to its best effect. This is a non-operating replica. Uh, I don't know who built it, but the photo was taken at the Pioneer Flight Museum in Kingsbury, Texas, which is off to the west of us. They mm -hmm. specialize in World War I, if you wish, and early aircraft. And uh, they, uh, I contacted them and they said that no, it's not theirs. No, they do not have it. No, they don't know where it came from. But there it is in front of their hangar from several years ago. Now, uh, there is a, and it's a replica. This is not anything that's going to fly. Uh, this may be the aircraft that is on a pedestal in Texas City at the Texas City Museum. Mm. But uh, once again, <coughs> excuse me. Once again, this is a, a good view of the, uh, of the Burgess H and its configuration. Pioneer is a great, uh, great little air museum. It's a grass strip. They have two fly-ins each year, and it's uh, it's really a pleasure. I love getting out to air shows like that. Uh, everything flies in. You're up close. Uh, they rebuild vintage aircraft. They build vintage aircraft new mm -hmm. under contract for a, a number of uh, features, and it's great to be up front with a, a Fulker triplane or an SC5, uh, quite a number of things. It's uh, yeah. We're so lucky to have uh, 
the wide open spaces of Texas in order to have such uh, uh, facilities going on. Yeah. Uh, Texas City had more of an effect than just uh, the airplanes and the event on it. Uh, it influenced a number of uh, local aviators. And uh, I think before, I think I'm going to round up the uh, Texas City. Uh, like I said, they had a storm in June. And in August, they uh, vacated, went to San Antonio. And by November, everything that remaining of the camp was, was gone. So these people were only here from March until August, if you wish, of 1930, a very short encampment before they went to San Antonio. And like I mentioned, in 1914, the Army got rid of what they called dangerous mm -hmm. white flyers and replaced them with JN4s, the, the good old Curtis Jenny, which at the time was new and, and several leaps forward in technology. Uh, the first Aero Squadron at that point uh, would be based in San Antonio and would be in, uh, would go to uh, Chase Pancho Villa uh, in Mexico with their JN4s. And that's a very exciting story, uh, but it is not part of this story uh, because we're, I'm just talking about the Texas City encampment. You know, in, in researching this, and I've researched it several different places, and uh, I was reading a very authoritative, and I think this is a, an Air Force publication on the 1st Aero Squadron. And they're talking about all the all the diddly stuff that had to go on in Washington and and Georgia was too hot and all this. And then they're going to go there. The very detailed names, places, everything. And then they go straight to Pancho Villa. They don't even mention the deployment to Texas City. Wow. They don't say that. Oh well, they went there in bivouac for six months, or they went to Galveston. They just pick them up in San Antonio and off they go to uh, to fight Pancho Villa. And I'm sure that's a very exciting story, but it's not it's not my story. And it's not the thing that I'm trying to look at. Most people here had don't know about the, the Texas City deployment mm -hmm. or what it was or what good was it. Uh, there's a very nice museum in Texas City. The, Texas City Museum, and they have quite a bit on it. And uh, I think more people should know about it. And of course, that's that's my my Facebook page and my job as Houston's aviation history. And I consider Houston to be the whole southeast mm -hmm. corner of Texas. This had this encampment was part of this very early business in Texas with the first airplane flight in 1910, the 1911 air show, and now in 1913, we have this deployment of, of, of aircraft. Uh, Southeast Texas uh, was certainly a, a hotbed for early development. And, and since we're talking in, in, in circumstance here about the upcoming Ellington Air Force Base, Ellington, of course, would be along in four more years. So they'd be back uh, to this area. They like the big open grass spaces. They like the proximity to the ports. They like the proximity to railroads. And uh, they would plant their roots in 1917 at Ellington and build a quite a large facility there, which is still in use. So it took a while. But uh, Southeast Texas was uh, at the forefront of early aviation history, that's for sure. One of the people that was influenced by the Texas City encampment is uh, Colonel Ralph Royce uh, here, which uh, you can see in this excerpt from a uh, cartoon series, mm -hmm. the uh, Hall of Fame. And uh, he himself uh, is mostly known for, of course, chasing Pancho Villa, but that was the first Aero Squadron. And uh, if, uh, I don't know how, how much of that you can read in that comic, but of course, these are always fun. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the clincher here is that his son, Ralph Royce Jr., 
uh, is a noted local uh, uh, flyer, yeah. uh, head of the Lone Star Museum at, at one point. Uh, he's the air boss at the Wings Over Houston Air Show. I want to say decades, uh, but many, many, many it's, years. It's, it's been a few years. Yes. Uh, and he was also uh, he was also, uh, I think, uh, executive director of uh, CAF for a number of years when uh, when we were located out in Midland. He was uh, one of the one of the leaders of the CAF at that time before uh, moving back home to the Houston area. Right. And, and so this is how you see the effect, the effect yes. that uh, that this early encampment had on uh, on the locals in the area. There's a. Uh, there's a whole nother story to be told about the aviators from Galveston, but we're not going to go there today. Let's see what the next one is. There you go. Um, Jimmy Waddell. Yeah. And, you know, if you know of Jimmy Waddell, you know who I'm talking about. If you don't know about Jimmy Waddell, you need to find out about Jimmy Waddell. Uh, he's a Texas City boy, of course. And he hung, as many young boys did, at the uh, First Aero Squadron camp because they had airplanes. Can you imagine being a young child and and their airplanes? Yeah. I mean, wow, you know, uh, me too. Yep. <laughs> and uh, he was uh, so enthused by all this, but he made aviation his life's work. And he went on to uh, build race planes, uh, win racing, speed categories, and all the rest of it. This uh, He did move to Louisiana, but when he died, they brought him back and buried him down, down here. But here is one of his, his more well, well-known airplanes that he designed, and uh, the uh, 121. Uh, that's Roscoe Turner hiding in the, uh, the cockpit. In the back, we can see Jimmy Waddell, and on the tail, I've circled Waddell Williams, which mm-hmm. is the uh, which is the company that he and his partner Williams founded to build these racing airplanes. Uh, they also started an airline, Waddell Williams, uh, which picked up contract airmail Route 29, which brought the airmail to Houston from New Orleans in uh, 1929. So. Uh, he had a big it had a big effect on him and he had a bit a big effect on it uh, uh, in his life and what he did here he is just a good old country boy with his tousled hair uh but he's a speed demon demon this is an ad from a uh, period magazine that that shows him we forget how these early aviators engrossed the public uh with their exploits uh, their aw shucks kind of demeanor uh, as they continued what is private research and development into improving uh, aviation uh, technology and uh, development. Like I said, he would eventually be killed in an aircraft crash. A uh, body was brought back and he is buried in West Columbia, Texas, which is just south of me here. There is a very nice Waddell. Uh, museum in Louisiana. I suggest you check it out if you're in that area. They go into much more detail about uh, this unknown, uh, uh, relatively unknown uh, flyer. Now, here uh, is uh, Waddell right in the middle, Jimmy Waddell in the middle, uh, with his partner, Williams, off to the left. Williams was the guy with the money, and Waddell was the guy with the smarts. You know, it's like Rolls Royce, right? Williams, Waddell, Williams. And as you can see here, they're conviving with a friend of theirs, which I'm pretty certain that you'll recognize who he is. So uh, Jimmy Waddell was recognized in the air racing as a uh, as a leader, an innovator, and an achiever. So yeah. this is one the, of the uh uh-huh. the, the air racing of the, the late 20s and into the 30s. I mean, that was really where uh, a, a lot of aviation technology was being, as, as you pointed out, privately uh, financed. And these airplanes were going faster and faster and faster and, and really outpacing what the what the military had developed. And uh, was, They were uh, outperforming, outperforming yes. military aircraft again and again. And, uh, and yes, so that's where the technology was going. And Jimmy Waddell was at the forefront of that. Mm-hmm. And like I say, it's, 
he hung around a good crowd of people. That's true. But here we go. One of the uh, the first Aero Squadron was also a training squadron. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned at first that only Benjamin Fulu had any qualifications as a pilot, and the Army uh, pulled his uh, his license and told him to get out there and go fly in San Antonio, and, and he did. And uh, he would teach the other ones, uh, the other uh, students, how to fly, and they crashed a lot. Mm -hmm. But they got it. But one of the lieutenants that they taught in uh, in uh, Texas City uh, was Lieutenant Eric Ellington, uh, who got his taste of and his license and his pilotage skills uh, in Texas City and went on to uh, be a uh, Army aviator. Uh, you saw the photo before from North Beach, California, which mm -hmm. is near San Diego, which is where they would uh, transfer to uh, after uh, Texas City. And unfortunately, it was in uh, North Beach, California, that Lieutenant Eric Ellington suffered a fatal crash along with a student. Four years later, uh, when they opened were going to build and considering, they decided to use his name to honor him to put his name on the new airfield just south of Houston, Ellington Field. And with that, we have the, uh, the ultimate uh, descendant of uh, Texas City uh, yeah. was Lieutenant Eric Ellington, who got his wings there and then got his name put on our airbase, and whose name today still uh, is used for that. Uh, now it's an airport rather than a field. Uh, so we go full circle. Texas City had a major influence on young men and aviators in our area. And because of the legacy of Eric Ellington, uh, it continues to honor the history of the uh, the early this is remember it's not the army air force here right. this is the aero squadron of the signal corps the very earliest military applications started here in uh, texas city and continues to today by honoring a uh, pilot from texas city eric ellington yeah so there you go it's it's amazing that the very compressed time frame of of when they were in Texas City and the ripple effect that it's had uh, throughout aviation, and when you right. when you think of you know the the, the Pancho Villa uh, expedition in 1914, the air racing and all the all the people who came from around the country to watch these air races, it was it was the spectator sport in the in what was called the golden age of of air racing in the 20s and 30s, and then uh, Lieutenant uh, Ellington himself uh, becoming the namesake. Tragically, of of the uh, of the the airport that still lives on today and still hosts a major air show and and NASA is there along with, you know, uh, lots and lots of uh, great aircraft, uh, both uh, private and and warbird aircraft and it's just amazing that 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 first aero squadron that Texas City uh, influence is is still like you said still felt today. Yeah, well, I mean that's my job as a historian is to tell a story his story. And and to link these things together because very few things just simply appear right. and uh, just show up. Everything came from somewhere, and everything is interconnected. And that's why I, I limit my focus to Houston's aviation history because I think there are many stories local that are local that can be told that show the interconnectedness of all the parts. Yeah. And if you want to learn more. Uh, please join me on Facebook at Houston's Aviation History, where we look at these things. And tomorrow is a, a noted day, by the way. You'd have to you'll have to tune in to find out. Uh -oh. It's not military, but it's important for the Houston area. And uh, love to I'd love to see you there. Please come on down. Good. And uh, you'll also be doing a, a live presentation um, in just a few days. 
Right. Uh, at the 1940 Air Terminal Museum at Hobby Airport in Houston, uh, one of a, a very few classic air terminals from yes. the 40s. Uh, a lot of people, and see here, <laughs> Steve is another one of those stories. A lot of people, most people don't know that the wasps got their start in Houston. Everyone knows and thinks of Sweetwater, Texas, where they did spend much of their time. Mm -hmm. But the first classes, the initial deployment, that's all in Houston at the Houston Municipal Airport. So we're going to look at historic photos that show the wasps in Houston at the Houston airport with their airplanes at the airport. It's a, it's a, it, it has several local tie-ins. It's a lot of fun and I can tell you it's a thrill for me to be in a building uh, that is so historic for so many different reasons. And the WASP story is one of them. Come on down. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great, uh... Uh, the uh, air terminal there. There's there's only a few buildings like that that, that still exist uh, in in the country. That uh, you know that the iconic looking uh, air terminal that that you see there in in Houston. Um, I think there's one in in Dayton, Ohio that they're trying to restore. And uh, Lakefront Airport in in New Orleans has something that's kind of similar. But um, just when you, especially the one in Houston, anytime I see it, you just you just know that that's an airport. <laughs> and yeah, not only an airport, but a really cool airport. Yeah, it's one of a few surviving examples of a passenger air terminal mm -hmm. from the golden age of aviation. And uh, you can make a short list uh, and you don't even need one hand to count them. Yeah. Uh, when you add up the fact that it's restored in kind, mm -hmm. uh, that it's open to the public. And of course, we're at a major airport. Uh, Hobby Airport is right there and you can, you can fly in. You can also come bring your airplane and come to our ramp yep. and uh, be right at, at the airport. It's uh, extraordinary for me. It has been extraordinary to have access to the building and the building's history, yeah. uh, which is <laughs> time and time again, I come up with the stories for it, but that's time for another day. <laughs> I just hope that y'all can come down and visit me there. And uh, I, I love talking about all this stuff. There is so much yeah. neat stuff that, that is hidden just below the surface uh, that when you turn it over, you know, it's like when you turn a stone over out by the creek, you're going to find snakes and snails <laughs> and all sorts of things. Well, that's what happens here at uh, in Houston's aviation history. We turn over a little stone and guess what? There are people and companies and things that happen and uh, they're almost forgotten these days. Yeah. Well, I'm glad someone is is uh, taking time to preserve those stories. And Michael, where did where did your interest in aviation, specifically the Houston aviation uh, history, come from? What what was what was your inspiration to start, as you said, turning rocks over? Well, flying when I was a child. Okay. Uh, I've been able to trace back uh, my flying as a child uh, to the summer of 52 when I was one year old. Okay. Uh, and uh, because we had to fly to grandma's house, right? And, uh, and that took us through Houston. And so I had every year that dose of airplanes. And the dose, of course, are the great prop liners, uh, the Douglas, the Constellations, the Converse, the DC-3s. Oh. And uh, so aviation was a, a magic time machine. Uh, we get in and go up, and after a few hours of shaking and noise, we're somewhere else. <laughs> uh, it was thrilling, and I know that I am not alone in these type of feelings. That is true. The, the passion that I see among aviators, pilots, people interested is very impressive, and, uh, and I'm there with them. And uh, I just want to bring out the hidden stories. Good. Any, any final thoughts before we wrap up tonight? No, I thank you for your time. Uh, we, I, I'm developing other uh, uh, subjects of, similar to this, military aviation in the Houston area. And uh, I'll discuss those with you at another time. I hope we can come back and, and do it again. I enjoy these sessions. And you know why I enjoy it? 
I that? learned so much. I found out things I didn't know about this, and there are some things I'm going to pursue. But I enjoy it because I learn and Good. never stop learning. Absolutely. And uh, where can where can folks find you on Facebook? Well, Houston's Aviation History. It's one okay. of several sites on Facebook that I'm running. Uh, for those of you on that don't like Facebook, I apologize. I understand. <laughs> However, it makes for a very convenient format to reach a lot of people very right. quickly and, of course, put up a lot of pictures. I can tell you that everyone loves old pictures. Oh, yeah. And uh, I have a quite a resource of old pictures. And better than that, I can tell you what's in those photos and when they were taken. So, and, and that is, is a lot of fun. So I, I, I hope to see you there. All right. And, of course, your uh, presentation, June 17th at the uh, Air Terminal, talking about the WASP history in Houston. That's right. Come on by. And, you know, I love discussions. I love uh, questions. Uh, I love to talk about this stuff because there is a lot of uh, a lot of material that crosses a lot of different disciplines. All right. Well, thank you everyone for uh, for joining us this evening. You don't forget to click that like, subscribe, or follow buttons, and we can let you know about our future shows. As always, if you have uh, ideas for a topic you'd like to uh, see us cover, or a specific airplane, or maybe someone uh, from aviation history, uh, just drop Leah Block an email at media at cafhq.org. Michael, as always, a pleasure having you uh, on the show tonight, and we'll look forward to doing this uh, again maybe in a couple of months. See you next time. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Thank you. And until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a great night.